Richard Skipper celebrates. Every show is a celebration. Richard Skipper celebrates the best in entertainment. Each show, Richard delivers the artists you love, showcasing what makes them unique. Never gossipy. The antidote to a sometimes hectic world. Now, here's your host, Richard Skipper. Happy Wednesday, everyone. And welcome to the latest edition of Richard Skipper Celebrates. For those of you who are here for the first time, my show is about celebrating. I celebrate life, I celebrate art, I celebrate artists, I celebrate the theater. Uh, and on a normal day, whatever that means, today would be a matinee day. And I am also today celebrating Bonnie Comley. I am so thrilled that she said yes to being here today. Uh, she is a three-time uh, Tony Award winner, uh, Broadway producer. She is has two uh, Drama Desk Awards, and she has an Olivier Award, and that's just on a Wednesday. So, Bonnie, thank you for being here today, first of all. Oh, thank you for having me. It, it is such a thrill. I, I want to ask you, first of all, um, as I said in my introduction, on a normal day, uh, this would be... Uh, a matinee day. Uh, you have not slowed down, however, uh, over the past year. We're going to talk about that. Uh, you are probably one of the hardest working women in show business. And I want to talk about the path that led you to where you are today. Um, is What is a normal day like for you? Or is there ever such a thing as a normal day? Um, you know, there's, there's sort of routines that I have. So I get up like really early. Um, I try to do a little bit of working out. I try to have some breakfast and then I hit emails that I, I don't say I ignored, but you know, the ones mm -hmm. like you didn't necessarily prioritize as they came in. Um, and, uh, and so I've been working remotely, uh, for a lot of my career. Um, so the work from home thing has always been built in. So that isn't, hasn't really changed. Uh, what's changed is that now my business partner, who's also my, uh, husband is home with me for the last year and a half. So that was different. I was like, oh my God. Well, you know, it's funny because I remember <laughs> right, right after everything shut down, page six did a, a, a quick blurb about two Broadway actors uh, who after 51 days of shutdown said, we can't take this anymore. And being in uh, a committed uh, marriage myself, I want to ask you, has the past year and a half brought you closer together or are you finding that you're finding uh, more and more places to separate from? Well, we've been together for 25 years. We've been working together for 25 years. We were working together a little bit before that. Um, so, you know, I think working together is a hard thing. So mm -hmm. that's a, an, another question almost. Um, mm -hmm. But as far as just the, the, the challenges of the pandemic, I think it actually brought a lot of people closer. Um, and because you, uh, you know, it, it, it was fear. It was, you know, that sort of almost, I would say end of life, but we didn't know um, when, uh, you know, in March of 2020, uh, we were planning on going to a show that night. And we found out that one of our employees that, you know, at Broadway HD, we have three different offices. And we had a meeting uh, on Tuesday with all three of our offices meeting in the New York office. And then on Wednesday, we found out that one of our employees tested positive for COVID. And we were just learning at that time, and this was a deadly virus and we didn't know. And I thought, you know, we had to, we left the office at five o'clock and we got called after that. So our first thing was like, is everybody safe? Like everybody get home, we can't go back to the office. 
we all have to then, you know, quarantine and isolate. At that time, they were saying like two weeks. And so it was really terrifying. And, and I have, um, you know, I still have young children that are at home, not young, young, but I mean, they still live with me young. Um, and so, you know, it was that like all of a sudden you're looking at somebody saying like, if I get sick, if you get sick, if we both go down, you know, like who's going to take these children? You know, it was like, you know, you're suddenly looking at things, you know, in, in a, in a, in a heartbeat that you're like, is the will up to date? What do we get? You know, all these different, you know, the fears of all of that. And then to say, you know what? And then we heard all the stories about you're supposed to stock up on everything and, you know, toilet paper right. and Purell and masks and all these things that, you know, well, toilet paper was in my life prior to Pinot, but, you know, like Purell mm. and masks, I mean, the, the gloves, you know, the garbage bags, I mean, all these things that was like, you know, is it? I can't even go out. I can't even go out to go get that stuff because I'm supposed to quarantine. My husband is can't go out because he's gonna. He has to quarantine. So it was just like the logistics of how you manage. And then, and then we thought, you know, we're back in the office in two weeks, and the whole world kind of ended. Um, and for Broadway HD, we had um, we're going into our sixth year, so we were. Oh, an up and running, we were an established business and we're an established internet business. So that surprisingly, mm -hmm. we were on track. We really didn't miss a beat. And because I'm a, a mother that I want to work from home and I want to have days that I work at home, I had always tried to make sure that if anybody in our office needed to stay home, that we had that ability, that we weren't going to be, you know, like, oh, wow you know, Madeline's out. Now what do we do? Mm -hmm. was, you know, like th there's a backup system in place. And so we always had that there with a kind of a, you know, work remotely system um, just out of, I wanted that, <laughs> you know, so that was already in place. And then as an internet business, everything was already there. So I think a lot of it was the logistics around it and then getting over the fear but the fear was there. The fear is still there as we're looking at a variant now. Mm -hmm. um, so I think with the don't go outside, we, and we're not going to restaurants, everything in New York shut down. We live in New York City. So it was that. And then it's how much you depend on somebody mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, of, you know, you know, I I was in a good place with my husband prior to the pandemic. That's good. <laughs> so that, so the, the the forced isolation, the forced mm -hmm. uh, togetherness, um, you know, again, just strengthened our relationship because we rely on each other for work. We rely on each other to take care of our children. We rely on each other for so many things. I mean, little did I know I needed to rely on him to help me fix my. You know, like, can you cut my hair? Can you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, d d laundry, you know what I mean? Things that we didn't do in a, in the same way that we were doing in the pandemic were suddenly, you know, teamwork that we, uh, that we picked up that, um, you know, I mean, it wasn't just laundry, but it was, you know, just your daily routines that they were, they were disrupted in a, in a major way. And then so much concern about our colleagues. Um, I wrote an article um, that was posted back in November of 2020 about the um, the theater industry and ambiguous loss and disenfranchised grief because we're an industry just in New York City Broadway mm -hmm. has a hundred thousand workers and that's not off Broadway that's not the cabaret clubs that's not the off off that's just on Broadway there's a hundred thousand mm -hmm. people that were suddenly out of work overnight. Um, and with a deadly virus, we weren't sure who's coming back to work. What is that going to look like? Am, did I age out? Is that show going to reopen? You know, like all these things. And with with ambiguous loss, it's you're, there's no end to it. So there's no closure and there's no social uh, systems in place to mm -hmm. support that. So, you know, if you you know, my mom died uh, just about two years ago. And, you know, it was a horrible experience. It's one of the worst experiences that you can have is the death of a family member. Mm -hmm. But there was, there's social systems in place that help you get through that. So there's a mourning period and you have friends surround you and they're sending you flowers or cards or emails or, you know, calling and saying, you know, I'm so sorry, you know, but with this 
are we going back to work or not? You know, like that I might have lost my job. I, I'm furloughed. I there's no set. You can't really grieve. You don't know if you're grieving. People didn't even know. So you're not sleeping right because you're terrified of a deadly pandemic. You're not eating the same because whatever your routine was before, whether you, you know, had eggs and bacon for breakfast, the eggs and bacon distribution system has been disrupted. So I don't get the same eggs or I can't get bacon or I don't have paper towels and toilet paper, you know, so all of that is now just thrown up into the air and there's no, you don't even recognize it. So you're losing sleep. You're not eating the same, you know, depression sets in. And then we're in an industry that we really didn't know mm -hmm. is it coming back. I mean, there's still, we're looking at all the shows. We're looking at everybody that's buying tickets for, you know, September and beyond, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. you know, but there's still some people that are not quite sure. And how is this going to work with, are we masked? Are we vaccined? Are we, you know, do you just trust the person beside you that they have a vaccine? Am I wearing a mask? Are they required to wear a mask? You know, all of those uncertainties are still looming. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, it's just kind of, and, and about now people are starting to come back to work. But for about, a, you know, a year plus, 85% of those people were out of work. And, you know, as you said, that, you know, people were getting... Uh, separating in relationships. They were separating because they couldn't stand living with each other. <laughs> That's true. That's right. true. But they were also separating because, you know, some of these people, they were, they moved to New York and they were living in apartments that they could only afford because of the job they had. And now your job is gone and questionable whether or not it's going to come back. So you have all these people that are moving back to you know, because New York City is such a transient city, they're all moving back to live back home with their parents, or they're moving back home to live where they can. You know, your the disruption in people's personal lives were just, you know, unprecedented. I mean, mm -hmm. how many times have we used un, I, I, unprecedented was not a word in my vocabulary before mm -hmm. like a year and a half ago. You know, so well, the interesting <laughs> thing is that you know one of my first interviews when I started doing this was with Donna McKechnie. Yeah, we are all in a profession uh, where the there there are huge gaps sometimes between jobs, and it's always this rat race where we're looking to get the next job, and for something like this, as you're saying, uh, we are also we're not on any firm footing whatsoever in good times. In, right? in good times, but looking now and, and moving forward, um, are there backup plans in place? Uh, I mean, we don't know what the next six months are going to hold for us. You know, I I am an eternal optimist. So I do believe that, um, especially for, you know, what we're looking at in this sort of, um, you know, reopening of Broadway and the realignment of who who's on Broadway and who gets to work on Broadway. The onstage part is especially a meritocracy. Mm -hmm. uh, it is if you are qualified, if you are talented enough and have the stagecraft to be able to do eight shows a week, come on down. You know what I mean? So there's sort of always been a level of that. Um, but the behind the scenes has been less diverse, less inclusive. Um, and a lot of that is because it's a career that people don't know anything about. Mm -hmm. um, I find from doing uh, classes and guest lecturing with um, people that want to enter into the business that there is, there's uncertainty. I mean, everybody wants, you know, they all start, they all want to be actors. You know, like, I want to be an actor because you can see it. You know, you see what's on the screen or you see what's on the stage and you look, and, oh, I get that. But for every person that's on a Broadway stage, there's 25 people backstage that At you least. have no yeah. idea what those people were you know that you don't know what they're doing so mm -hmm. how would you know that's a job that you want unless you could see what they're doing um so you know so you go in and then once you get into like a theater school um a drama school someplace then they start introducing you to these other careers and, and it always it's a pet peeve of mine when people start saying well it's a fallback career and i just like, how could you take, you know, somebody's 
$35,000 in tuition and start talking to them as soon as they get in about a fallback career. I'm like, mm -hmm. what? No, let's just train them to be the best that they can be. And I think that, you know, having so much, having so much experience in the business because of my age, um, I have seen people that your priorities change. Mm -hmm. You just, you know, you just don't really, you, you think you want to be an actor and then you get there and you start doing all these auditions and it's like, people are, you know, literally nauseous off, you know, outside of the casting, you know, uh, session going, uh, you know, what am I doing here? What am I doing? You know, so I think there's a, a, a reassessment, like, is it worth it? You know, maybe this, maybe that on stage thing really isn't for you. Um, and so I think people do start to, to shift and pivot still knowing that they want to stay within show business, but, but, but realizing that there are other careers out there. And I think that that's my, um, strongest um, uh, it's a, his suit mm -hmm. is that I, can, I I I did everything I've I've learned like from the you know being in the box office selling tickets to you know sweeping the floor to all the way across I understand the business I'm not that good at all those jobs but I've had to do them at some point um, no, but, you know it's interesting to value to that. I'm glad that you bring this up because there are so many other aspects to this business than what we see in the spotlight. Uh, and it takes those people that are running the spotlight for the spotlight to be there in the first place. And, uh, you know, for someone who came up through the ranks of going through summer stock and the EMC programs and all the things that you do working in theaters where you're cleaning bathrooms and you are working box office and you're pulling the curtains and you're doing all those things, I want to go back to your beginnings. Um, when you were a young girl, um, was it being on stage that originally drew you to the theater? I'm going to assume that it was. And if it wasn't, <laughs> what was the spark for you? You know, I, um, I'm from a very middle class family. So my my mom worked at the phone company. My dad was, a, you know, got out of the Navy and worked as a mechanic, an elevator mechanic. And while we, you know, they had four kids and then they decided to, you know what, we can, we can do our own elevator company. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so on the kitchen table, my mom's doing, you know, the bookkeeping and my dad's, you know, working like 80 hours a week, you know, fixing elevators. And I think that sort of entrepreneurial spirit was learned at home. Um, and watching somebody, uh, you know, fail at things that they mm. pitched for an account and then oh, we didn't get that building. Oh, you know, oh, gee, you know, and the, uh, the, the, the terror of like, oh my God, we have four children and we didn't, you know, that money is not coming in and now what do we do? But you know what, we're going to be all mm -hmm. right. So it's never really threatening, but we always saw somebody who was striving for something else and was, it, you know, occasionally missing the mark on it. Um, so I think the entrepreneurial piece was uh, learned very early. Um, and then from that, I went uh, into uh, business school. So my undergraduate degree is in business. Mm -hmm. And then business to me is kind of like a medical degree, like, okay, you're a doctor, what are you specializing in? <laughs> so for me, it was show business. So my master's degree is actually in um, uh, broadcast journalism mm -hmm. and TV production. So from the TV production, I ended up moving from Massachusetts to New York to get an internship. And then I never went back to Massachusetts. <laughs> and, but from learning all of the aspects of the production side of the business, I could I could do pretty much anything. And I could get onto sets. I could get, you know, um, anywhere. And then I ended up getting a reporter job for theater, um, mm -hmm. which again was by default. And I, when I speak to people wanting to get into the industry, it's like, you can't take anything personally because you have no idea what the, the goings on were before you got there. So, um, you know, my TV job that I had, um, that turned into, you know, a national, uh, television show as a reporter and host for um for a show on the uh travel channel yes but because somebody else didn't want the job you know so i was there i was sort of this vanna white you know that they had hired because of the way i looked and i sort of ran in and out of places without ever saying anything and it was for a pilot for a show and then when the pilot wasn't picked up nationally the woman that they had who was a a local TV anchor said, I'm not giving up my local TV, 
you know, anchored job here for like a, a local cable. <laughs> like that's not it. So mm -hmm. she just said no. And the producers kind of looked around and said, oh, you know, do we really want to go through rehiring all this thing? Oh, Bonnie, here, you read these index cards. So I would, you know, do my stand up piece and say, oh, here we are on the Richard Skipper show. And let's go inside and talk to Richard. And then I'd go inside. I'd have, you know, I'd have these index cards that I would read off of off camera to someone and 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 then afterwards I'd have to do a voiceover to tie everything together. So that experience that I they didn't want me. <laughs> they just sort of like, oh okay, here this are we standing right there? Oh, here you get on camera, you know, that kind of a um, you know, not quite discovered at the soda fountain <laughs> kind of thing. But I was already there and I proved myself that I would show up on time. I had a good attitude, you know, all those, all those like good work ethics. Um, and, you know, and that led me to the on camera position, which mm -hmm. from an on camera position, you get an agent. And so the agent then could get me, I was doing voiceovers for the TV show. Anyway, I got more voiceovers from the voiceovers. I got on camera commercials from the on camera commercials. I ended up getting theater, uh, which I had no training for, <laughs> you know, which, I, you know, at whatever, 23 years old, uh, you know, I didn't know what I didn't know. So it was like, sure, improv. Okay. <laughs> Let's go. Um, and it was, it was, you know, if you asked me to do that now, I'd be like, oh my God, no, you don't, do you know what people can say while you're just standing there and you don't know? So you know, it, it, a lot of these things I just, I truly stumbled onto mm -hmm. because I was in the, in the in the in the system there um you know I, I i had jobs that because i would show up i lived i was able to live in manhattan you know um would always have i had a phone service back when you had you know like no cell phones so i, I, worked, I, I worked for the green room answering service but i want to back up for a moment when you mentioned that you left massachusetts to come to new york did you come to new york with a job or did you come in pursuit of a job I came with an internship and then my internship turned into a job okay. um, because again, it's that like you show up on time and you have a good attitude and, 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 and at that time, I mean, even still there are internships that mm -hmm. don't pay. So I had to, I had another job that I was doing to pay to be able to live where, you know, in, mm -hmm. in Hell's Kitchen in New York, you know, while I had this internship, but it turned into a job, you know, and then I got a national, you know, TV show, um, I mean, with, you know, <laughs> I mean, on a dance show and I really wasn't a dancer, but there was those MTV sort of back oh, yeah. you know, things where they just give you a dance move of go, hey, you know, you do this a couple times, it's, you know, and, and just stand there. But in the crowd, they, you know, just sort of feature different people and, you know, and those sorts of things. And then, as I said, from having a national TV show, the voiceover stuff that, you know, I, I could get thousands of dollars for a voiceover mm -hmm. that would pay my rent for months, you know, and then all of that was, you know, union that then got me the insurance. So I was okay covered for that. Um, so there was always, but it was never the same and it was never uh, predictable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All of it could end at any moment. Mm -hmm. So as you're signing leases and things, you know, so you're, you know, your point earlier about, you know, Donna McKechnie and how there's down times and all that. But because I was able to go from I can do on camera to behind the camera to like, I, you know, I can, I'm not very good, but I can set the sandbags on the lighting for a <laughs> union, you know, MTV, you know, music video shoot, you know, those kinds of things that you're, you're just, you know, learning everything that's you know part of the the collaboration part of the process mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so the tv thing sort of turned into theater um because i was covering theater um mm -hmm. i would never i mean i was one of four kids we didn't go to theater it wasn't anywhere on the entertainment radar mm -hmm. um, so you know going to the theater when i finally went because i was covering it for a tv show and going in and saying Oh my God, this stuff is like great. You know, you should tell me. <laughs> Look at them. They sing, they dance. You know, this is amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and the power of, you know, holding a microphone and knowing that you're going to be, uh, you know, sharing this video with yeah. thousands of people. I'm looking at all these really talented people that are clamoring to be the one that gets interviewed on my TV show. And I'm like, 
my God, did you see that person sing and dance? Like they were singing and dancing at the same time. You know what I mean? It's like, oh my God, that's amazing. You know, I mean, you see stuff like that on TV and, but it was, you know, it's, it's the, I, I, so I fell in love with theater and it was magical. Um, and as I said, then, you know, the, the jobs that I had, I was able to get theater things because I have a TV show. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like, you know, okay, let's, you know, put you over here and then you can mention it or have somebody mention it on your TV show, which helps to sell tickets, we hope, you know, so there's always an element of that. So, I mean, a lot of my, um, my stuff is, you know, some of it's being lucky and being in the right place, but it's also having your, what I describe to students is you have your, you know, your toolbox, you have everything in your toolbox. Like, what did you want? To do today you know what you want me to wear today and who am i supposed to be and what time do i show up and who do i report to mm -hmm. you know all of those things are a part of the business um which a lot of people that are interested in the artistic side um don't always want to talk about you know? so, exactly well i want to go again back to your arrival in new york did you know anyone when you first came to new york or were you truly on your own and these opportunities are happening you were ready you had your toolbox ready to go uh and move forward uh what kept you in new york at that time uh and uh was it an easy transition coming from massachusetts to new york and from four kids to being on your own? Um, well, I was not really on my own. I came and lived in a convent um, in Hell's Kitchen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's kind of a story all on its own. But um, Bonnie, that, there's a book here. You've got to write a book. Yeah, well, I don't know if it's of interest to anybody else. And a lot of this, it just doesn't happen in the same way anymore. This was like 1981 that I came to New York City. I came um, in 79, so I know exactly yeah, what so you were it, like at that time. It's different. I mean, Hell's Kitchen was, it was called Hell's Kitchen for a reason. Now right. it's that cool and trendy and whatever. But, um, you know, I would to get off of the, you know, the bus at the Port Authority and walk from 42nd to 54th and 11th um, where I lived. Um, it was very different, but I loved it. I loved it. I came from a very small town um, and, you know, Massachusetts and Boston specifically, you know, it's not just the so there's a, there's a rivalry. There just is a rivalry, whether you look at it in, in a, through a sports lens, like you can't, you can't, you know, you cannot wear like a red socks, you know. <laughs> how, how did you end up how did you, in New York? <laughs> how did you end up in a convent? I was I was coming to do a semester of school. I didn't want to, you know, sign a lease for a year. And I had asked, and you know, I mean, at that time it was before the internet. It was like before, almost like before telephones. <laughs> was, you know, um, so I was looking in the in a yellow pages for um, you know hotels, and then it was like this, you know, sort of long term hotels that were really high end things. But in there, there was this. Um, convent um, on 54th and 11th um, that was by an order of um, uh, Mexican nuns that most of them uh, did not speak English. Um, and so I called and you needed um, references from your church in order to be able to live in the residences. And um, they had curfews. <laughs> and, um, so, so, so I was willing to live with that because I wanted to try it. Mm -hmm. My parents were terrified, but they liked the idea of like, oh, okay, so she lives in a convent and the nuns will look out for her and there's a curfew. So if she's not in at 11 o'clock at night, somebody will like send out a, <laughs> an APB or something. And um, so I, I lived there. Um, you know, I, got, I, I taught Sunday school um, back in Massachusetts. So I had my references from the church. Um, so I was able to move in. And I just love New York City and I loved, you know, everything about it. And so, as I said, I didn't end up going back. Mm -hmm. You know, I finished um, I finished my last classes that I needed uh, that were for Emerson College in Boston um, at Queens College. They I you know, they had similar classes. So I had to get myself out to Queens and I finished there. But it took me a lot longer because I didn't stay in Boston and, and finish, which I don't recommend. I, whenever I talk to students, I'm like, just go all the way through, okay? Because it's such a pain in the padupa to have to go back and finish those classes after the fact. Um, so stay in school mm -hmm. um, and stay in school for, for the acting as well. Um, I, you know, I, 
am, I have kids and I'm always, I, I'm a big proponent of education. And mm -hmm. yes, theater, uh, especially, and TV, uh, TV even more so, and movies and commercials, it's about a look and it's about what they're, you know, uh, sort of an immediate reaction with mm -hmm. a camera. Um, whereas theater is really, um, it's the, it's the talent plus the stagecraft. And I think that, you know, not that you have to be in college, but I think that without the stagecraft, you're not going to last as long and you're not going to be as on, you know, an obvious choice for a casting director or a director or the musical director, whoever it is that you're auditioning for without the training. Cause it's very hard to take raw talent and expect them to do eight shows a week. Um, so I really am a big um, proponent, proponent of training, you know, train, 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 and it's never done. I totally agree with you. Never. Looking back in those early days when you first came to New York, um, is there anything differently that you would have done? Or do you feel that everything unfolded as it should have at that time? No, I'm where I'm supposed to be because of who I met and what I did. And so, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, sometimes it's like, oh, could I, would I, but I really don't think so. I mean, I'm, I'm so blessed with everything that I have that to change any of it, I wouldn't change, you know, I'd have to, you know, it's that butterfly effect. I wouldn't go back and change anything. That's um, wonderful. And looking back again, um, were, was there um, a moment where you mapped out a career that you were looking to have, or did it just happen again, as you said, by the people you knew being oh. at the right place at the right time? I, no, I never mapped out anything that worked out the way that I mapped it. <laughs> so I do, I'm a list person. I make lists. I make goals that I want to reach, um, you know, and, and I'm also somebody that, you know, again, it's that entrepreneurial mm -hmm. uh, learning from my kitchen table at home. Mm -hmm. um, you make plans and then you, you know, it, <laughs> then you adjust and then you pivot and then you do whatever is, you know, is, is where you're, you're heading kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, you know, that's my thing is like, you know, you always have the plan B and the plan B is the one that was supposed to be. Mm -hmm. That's what plan B is mm -hmm. quite often. That's where you were really supposed to go. Um, you know, you might have thought you were going to go somewhere else or wished for something else. Um, but I'm also, again, you know, that, that eternal optimist that if you want it, you'll get there. You might not get there in the way that you wanted. You might not get there in the, you know, the role that you wanted. It's like, oh, you know, it, in, in talking to somebody with a, um, a best supporting Tony, <laughs> I was like, well, I really thought I was going to get it. And I said, if you are actually going to go there, where you're going to say you're not happy with your best supporting Tony award because you at one time had a role that you thought you deserved the best leading, you know, role. I have no pity. So, you know, I mean, it's <laughs> you good for you. Well, I, mean, you I, mean, I think people want that sometimes. Like I really wanted the other, but you know, but you look at some people and, we look at our, our life with a lens of who's like just in your peripheral vision. Mm -hmm. And I think that literally as you get older, your peripheral vision, like your vision starts to really narrow. It really mm -hmm. does, literally. Um, and I think that, you know, that's also true for how you, you know, live your life. But I think that, you know, when you, you know, a lot of it is your your life experiences, and as I said, who's around you. So mm -hmm. I've seen, uh, you know, several, um, you know, people, young people, students that grow up in New York City, and they have access to go to Broadway shows, and they're they want to do it, they want to be in show business. But when people ask them, and they're great singers or dancers or actors, and people say. You know, or, you know, how's your singing? They go, well, not very good. Because they're comparing themselves to Kristen Chenoweth or Sutton Foster or Bernadette Peters that they've seen. Whereas if they were in the Midwest someplace, they would have been the lead in the high school musical and someone would say, well, how's your singing? They're like, I, I am the best. I am the, you know, like I had the auditorium at the, you know, Fairfield High School mm -hmm. on their feet. You know what I mean? It's sort of like, it's a, they have a different frame of reference for what, mm -hmm. because they never saw anybody 
but the other kids that were in the high school's plays, you know? Um, and I think that's, you know, part of my, my magic with Broadway HD is that I give people a bigger, wider perspective of the things that they can talk about, the things that they're familiar with, and their frame of reference. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really kind of a, you know, it, it's-, it's I, I wanna talk about Broadway HD uh, and how that all came to be. Okay. Well, as I said, I never saw a Broadway show until I was an adult. Um, didn't really know what it was. And it was, it, oh, that's the, somebody's getting, I live with people. So if you hear noise. <laughs> it's perfectly fine. I live with people. Um, Life as it happens. Yeah, there you go. Um, so I always was shocked, I think, at the business model of Broadway shows, that when that curtain comes down for the final performance, it's kind of done. Like, a now what? You know, coming from a TV and film background, it was a little bit more, there's a, a life after the performers aren't performing anymore. Mm -hmm. And so I think Broadway HD was sort of always somewhere there. And then I covered theater for the shows that I worked on. Um, and again, you know, just talking to people about how, you know, um, you, you know, the, the closing when the customers don't come, you know, mm -hmm. it's like that, you know, devastation, but you're, and you're leaving the family of, you know, theater makers that you were surrounded with in that show. And then, you know, then trying to go look for the next show. Um, and so Broadway HD was sort of always a seed there. Um, my husband is a theater person from just the, to the core. Everything is about theater. He, he and for is, those who don't know, Stuart Lane. <laughs> yes, my husband Stuart Lane. And um, who I named Mr. Broadway, by the way, because 25 years ago, as the like we were all getting websites with you know, names on it, I it was like, you know, because people always, his name is spelled S-T-E-W, and people would always spell it like the more traditional way of S-T-U. So I'm like, I'm not getting Stuart Lamb because they're going to spell that wrong. Right. And so I was just sort of coming up with it, and I said, oh, you know what? Broadway.com was already taken. Broadway, all these different Broadway things. were taken. But I said, Mr. Broadway, I love that, Mr. Broadway. So it was sort of, you know, we got that website, and then it was... It was a really like an early blog because mm -hmm. what we do is I would post shows that we had seen or charity events that we had gone to or people that I was trying to support that were in a cabaret. You know, those kinds of things were the early things that were on his Mr. Broadway site. Um, but he is just theater to the core. And so with me, it was like covering theater, what a hassle it was, even for a TV show, um, because you couldn't see the show in advance. <laughs> so, so, and at that time in the 80s, the equipment was very different. It was That's much right. more invasive. So it was a what we call a three-quarter deck. So the tape was, you know, three quarters of an inch. Or, you know, so there were these big, big, huge cartridges that weighed five pounds a piece or something. Then there's gigantic cameras with a, a recording deck separately that was kind of like carrying like a big sort of a boom box thing. Then you had microphones, then you had, you know, tripods. So it was it was a what they called ENG cruise, which is electronic news. News gathering. So I was with it. I was trained to be on these ENG crews. So you'd go in and as the on camera person or the and sometimes a lot of times I was on camera and I was producing my segment and writing my segment. So I would have to have like all these jobs that you do and you'd go in and you couldn't see the show ahead of time. So you'd have one camera in the back of the theater that would be locked down and you're trying to have a camera person shoot something and you know you've got this big enormous stage which is fabulous and grand but you've got all these people that are like these little tiny people across the bottom of the of the camera you know and then the, when you never saw the show before you don't know who's going to talk next so the camera's like like flying all over the place if they're trying to do any sorts of close-ups you couldn't shoot more than 20 minutes you couldn't shoot an entire song and a lot of this is kind of was still in place up until just recently with streaming. So there was all of these challenges with translating theater to video. Um, and so I, it was always sort of a dream of like, oh, how would that be done? Um, and then the opportunity came for Stu in like 1992, um, was Will Rogers Follies at the Palace Theater. 
And Japan Satellite Broadcast wanted to come in to be one of the producers for the sole purpose of being able to shoot the show and do it as a pay-per-view in Japan. And so it was like, great, come on in, be a producer and, you know, shoot the show. Great, because it's never going to, you know, get into that space where, you know, another conversation about Broadway HD is the cannibalization of the live ticket sales, um, which we can get get back to that. But anyways, mm-hmm. but that was one of the first ones. And then we did um, Company with Aurelio Esparza, the one that was the revival where all of the actors actually played their instruments. Right. It was amazing. Um, and then we did Company with Neil Patrick Harris. We did uh, Romeo and Juliet with Orlando Bloom and Condola Rashad. We did uh, Cyrano with Kevin Klein. So we were shooting all these one at a time shows and critically acclaimed. And, you know, everybody's like, oh my God, this is amazing. You should do more of this. And I said, you know, these capturing the show in the theater, um, the, the, the industry term for it is a live capture or a digital capture. Mm-hmm. And I always say to people like, well, that's, you know, I say, but it's, that's it. It sounds like something that you wrestled something to the ground in order to be able to do. <laughs> and that's how you feel after you get done with it. It's like, oh my God, I'm glad that, that that was just like so exhausting. And then the, the money wasn't there because these types of this type of content is so specific that you had you know very limited distribution outlets mm-hmm, for it mm-hmm. so it was pbs and dvd and then occasionally would have something like we had the opportunity to do legally blonde on mtv which you know how luftig as the lead producer was like biting his nails like do we do this do we not do this it hadn't been done before to actually let the show out while the show was running, you know, and selling tickets on Broadway, you know, how, how, what is that going to look like? And he made the decision ultimately to let MTV shoot the show. And it was amazing. And it, it really helped, you know, when those were showing on MTV, you could see the box office just spike, you know, um, it didn't sustain because it wasn't streaming all the time, Mm -hmm. but it spiked. Um, And so we, you know, sort of looked at it after about 10 of these captures that we've done and said, you know what, they're, everybody loves them. We love them. We, you know, but it's exhausting. And we're, you know, some of them, we're just barely making our money back. So where's the business here? And it was probably about eight or 10 years ago that we, you know, really started looking at it and saying, you know, the world is going to stream it. So what would it look like if we did a streaming platform? Mm-hmm. And we aggregated the shows that we had, but at that time we probably had like nine or 10 which doesn't make a destination. So Mm -hmm. we looked to colleagues within the industry and said, we didn't invent bringing cameras into the theater during a Broadway show. You know, PBS has been doing it for 50 years and the BBC, which is the PBS equivalent Mm -hmm. in the UK, has been also been doing it for 50 years, Mm -hmm. but they only do one, you know, every, you know, once a year or something because they're so difficult to do. So we went to all these you know, different, um, you know, content producers. And we said, we're going to start a streaming platform and we're going to put all this stage to screen digital capture in one place. And we're calling it Broadway HD. You know, are you in? Are you down? What is it going to take to get your content onto our platform? And so we started building the technical piece, which is the you know, the, the, I mean, we say website, but when you think of website, like, okay, every actor has a website. You go on Weebly and then you put in, you know, bonniecolony.com and then you get, you know, that's not how, a, you know, a streaming platform works mm-hmm. in order to be secure. So there's a, a, a vault, basically. So there's a, a part of the business that's the vault that holds these shows mm-hmm. and protects them as, you know, from, from piracy, basically. Um, so there's the, 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 the show content. And then there is the, um, the consumer facing part that is up, you know, payment collection because you're suddenly getting people's credit cards or PayPal's or whatever it is that you're collecting currency that has to be rock solid and, you know, <laughs> 
a piracy free and, mm -hmm. and secure. And then there is the, you know, the, the social part of it, which is the interacting with the community that's out there. And so it's sort of like, I mean, it's very basic, but it's, so there's the three le levels. There's the, where the content is housed, where the payment is collection and the consumer facing part that we talk to our subscribers and we talk to other theater fans that are out there and, and tell them what we have on Broadway HD. And so while we were bespoke building all of that and then going and aggregating this content in August, October of uh, 2015, we launched with just over a hundred titles of full length stage plays and musicals. And it was amazing, you know, because we tried to be, uh, and we still try to be very uh, smart with our marketing and PR dollars. And we, within days, we had people reaching out to say, you know, I'm trying to watch your movies, but you don't take my currency. It's mm -hmm. like, where are you? <laughs> you know, like, I was thinking, we were doing just basically US, just tri-state when we were doing our marketing efforts, you know, so this is something that it just, like it goes out on the internet and because we were the first to market with this type of a, a, a platform that it got international recognition. So we had people from around the world starting to subscribe within days of launching and we never spent any money to go after them. So that was the first of like, what do we have here? Oh, that's kind of amazing. And then uh, about six months later with um, a roundabout theater company, which were, you know, it's an amazing theater company in New York City, amazing shows, but they are a nonprofit and they do limited runs of the shows. From mm -hmm. most of their shows, they have a finite end. You know, we're gonna do it for three months or six months, or we're gonna do it for a year. And then we're gonna, we, these are our theaters. We need to put another show in here. And so it's kind of built in that there's not gonna be cannibalization of the box office because they know the show is gonna end. So they were a perfect partner for us. Um, Everybody was, uh, you know, thrilled at the idea that we would live stream the show while it was still selling tickets. And so we made the Guinness World Record for being the first live stream of a Broadway show. Wow, um, that's really great. cool. It was really cool. And so, you know, with that, and then we did about ten or twelve other uh, live streams, which is the live live mm -hmm. and we found um well with the with the she loves me live stream we had 84 different countries that were streaming in real time which was shocking to us i mean there was some of them it was just one person in that country you know but it was like where are these how did they even find out about us we didn't you know like what you know it was again you just don't realize the power of the internet and how something just goes out there um at that time and so we you know looked at it and and said okay we got to do these other live streams but what we found after 10 or 11 of them was that for the broadway hd subscriber it was less important that the show be live live that then then that they had access to it later so they wanted to watch She Loves mm -hmm. Me. And mm -hmm. 84 different countries worth of people, you know, tuned in for the live. But then we captured it, which means you record it, basically. The capture is the recording. And that we had, and we still have on Broadway HD streaming. And that is what people go to. And we've had more, you know, obviously more people, <laughs> you know, whatever it is, like five years since that live stream um, that have watched it, then watched it on the one live stream at night. And for the added expense and the risk of doing a live stream, because you never know what's going to, I mean, and it's not just like, oh, the actor could trip over the rug or forget their line or something like that. It was, you're dealing with like satellite links mm -hmm. and remote trucks that, you know, we were doing one, um, uh, <laughs> we were doing a shoot with the American Theater Wing for their Centennial Gala and we had all of our permits to put all our remote trucks into the, you know, onto the street. And then um, the president decided that he needed the whole 42nd street. Cause we were, it was at Cipriani 42nd street needed the whole street to be cleared for a certain time. And it was like, we already had our trucks there. Now, where are you going to go with these trucks? It was, you know, I mean, so it, it you know, that kind of live live thing that was uh, unpredictable and all the permits were in place. But you don't turn around and tell the president that, you know, oh, excuse me, we're 
where the, this is American <laughs> theater. Well, I mean, well, live theater is live theater. Anything could go. <laughs> so, you know, that sort of stuff of the live, live. And as I said, I mean, for our subscriber, they really just want to see the show. And I think that's the power of it as well, is that it's, it's the convenience of streaming. It's at your convenience. It's not, oh, I have to race and get to my TV, you know, or my phone or whatever it is at a certain time. You have the leisure of you decide when you want to do it. And our content is two hours long. Mm -hmm. So you can stop and you can come back to it the next day or the next week or five minutes later after dinner. You know, you can watch Shakespeare for breakfast. I mean, you have so many more options with it. Um, exactly. when we have the convenience of streaming. And that's what we've done is that we've, we've aggregated all this content. Now we have over 350 full length stage plays and musicals. You know, we, you have access to all of them for under a hundred dollars for a year. Um, as long as you're connected to the internet, um, you can stream, you can stream these shows. And, um, you know, our Are you taking any content outside of New York, regional theaters, uh, concerts, anything beyond Broadway itself? Yes. We started experimenting with that because Broadway is, um, as I said, there's a fear of cannibalization of the live ticket sales, which is a very valid concern. Um, Stu and I, as producers of live stage shows, certainly understand. And as I said, when we watch the producers, the lead producers of Legally Blonde, you know, biting their nails and trying to decide if this was something that they wanted to do or not, uh, was to, you know, put a capture out there. Um, it was a big decision at that time. And that was, you know, we're talking like 10 years, 11 years ago, something like that. Um, and it's always that way because the, it's not within their regular scope of business. Um, they're, you know, you're talking about a $20 million stage play. And I think that we, value the digital capture and we have been valuing the digital capture in the wrong way. Um, for a lot of the producers, they look at it and they see it as an alternative to the show. Mm -hmm. But really from my experience of doing these for years, it's a long form commercial for the show. Mm -hmm. so the show. Is is an I mean, is that something that's difficult to uh, relate to some producers? It was more difficult before the pandemic, mm -hmm. um, but now if you look what's opening on Broadway, how many things already have some sort of a digital capture or a full length movie video of mm -hmm. the show already. And that helps to establish it. And that helps it to become a familiar brand and familiar music with so many people. So when you're asking them to spend $100 a ticket, the risk is eliminated if they've mm -hmm. seen the digital version. You know, I think before it was, you know, people, well, you know, it's not the same as being there live. It's like, well, well of course not. You know, I'm not live really either. I'm a, an electronic image on your screen somewhere. You know, I don't think we have to tell anybody like, you know, the thing on your screen, it's not a real person. You know, that reflection in the mirror, that's not another person in there. That's just, you know, I mean, it's kind of like, but that was part of the conversation. Before. Right. And as I said, it's valid because we don't have definitive proof that putting it all out online is going to not make some sort of dent or damage to the box office sales of that show. We don't have definitive proof. And I don't think we ever will because no two shows are the same. Exactly. It's just, and the timing of the shows aren't the same. Um, but I think that you can see coming back in the fall, we have Hamilton, which the Hamilton film is streaming on Disney Plus. You have Come From Away that's going to be on um, Apple Plus, I believe. Mm -hmm. You have uh, Diana the Music Diana. that will be on Netflix. Netflix. You have um, uh, Passover, which is streaming on, I believe it's Amazon Prime that Spike Lee did. You have, you know, Cats. Phantom of the Opera that are streaming. You know, those have been DVDs that were recorded 20 years ago. Um, mm -hmm. Those are still, you know, there's no problem with that. <laughs> so, you know, probably 10% of the shows that are coming back have a digital capture associated with them. Mm -hmm. And what are the ones that are selling first? 
the ones that have the digital cash right. associated right. with them. You know, the other shows are struggling. You know, the other shows are struggling because we don't, we, we're not a, a theater going culture in the mm -hmm. United States. We're just not. We are a movie going culture, absolutely, mm -hmm. but we're not a theater going culture. There's 350 million people in the United States and pre pandemic, 85% of those people would go and see a movie in the movie theaters compared to 15% of that 350 would go and see a live theater show at some point during the year. So we're looking at a very, you know, specific market, a very specific audience for this. Mm -hmm. And so when they don't know what's on Broadway, then they don't care what's on Broadway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They just don't. They don't understand it. And, you know, the Tony Awards is our, um, you know, our our Super Bowl, if you will. It's like where all the things are going to come and compete. But if you don't know who the players are, you don't, don't have anybody to root for. That's right. It's really hard. So that's why everybody's like, well, who's hosting? Who's presenting? We need those celebrity hosts and, and pre presenters because nobody knows who Katrina Link is yet. Nobody knows who Bernadette Peters is still outside of New York City, except for those of us who are the, uh, you know, maestro and the jungle dance. Whatever. Right. <laughs> but other than that, you know, it just, it's, it's hard for these people that are, you know, theater, theater people mm -hmm. that have dedicated their entire career. Um, we don't worship them in the same way that we worship our sports. Um, sadly, sadly, and that's what, you know, the mission of Broadway HD is to get these people out there. You all need to know who Katrina Link is and you can watch her on Broadway HD in Indecent. And then you can buy a ticket and see her in company with Patti LuPone. You know, so you suddenly have a frame of reference and you, you, you're a fan of these people. And that's what, you know, you know, so when people ask me about like, oh, well, you know, Broadway HD, you don't have everything. It's like, you know what? Netflix doesn't have everything. That's true. That's true. So, well, we but, are going to run out of time. And I, oh, no. And now I want you to come back anytime <laughs> you have anything, but I want to ask you, what do the next five months look like for you? Um, we're, we're working with the Broadway league. We're working with the American theater wing. And as president of the drama league, we're yeah, working with we didn't the even get to today. Yeah. Congratulations, yeah, to by that. the way. Yes. I'm the newly elected director, you know, uh, president of the drama league. Um, but we're, you know, with Broadway HD and me personally, the live piece is my passion. So everything I do is to promote the live stage. So even though I'm, you know, I'm selling subscriptions to a service that is streaming theater. It's to encourage people to go see live theater. You know, that's what the whole thing is about. Mm -hmm. So the, the next five months is me personally and Broadway HD uh, doing everything we can do to make sure that the Broadway industry comes back be bigger and better than ever. That's right. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to thank you for being here. Don't go anywhere right now. I want to thank everyone for being here. Um, I don't take for granted that you could have been anywhere else for the past hour. So the fact that you chose to spend it with us means a lot to me. So thank you for that. If this is your first time at Richard Skipper Celebrates, please subscribe. Um, I'm looking for subscribers as well. Um, and take a moment to check out one of the other videos. I'm all about celebrating, as I said at the beginning of the show. I celebrate artists and their body of worth, what it is that they bring to the theater. And Bonnie, thank you for all that you've brought to the theater and that you will continue to bring. Um, I also end every show by telling everyone to go out and do something nice for somebody else without expecting anything in return. Go to your Facebook friends list and the sixth name that pops up, reach out with a phone call, not an email message, not a text message, not a private message, but a phone call. And let that person know what they mean to you. As my dear friend David Friedman says, we're all in this together, but we're not in the same boat. And you never know what someone else is going through right now. So take the time to reach out. And as Bonnie has talked about today, um, you know, these live streams are there for you to enjoy now. But when the theaters come back, please, if you can go tonight, and buy a ticket for a show, it lets everyone know that theater will come back. 
bigger and brighter and better than ever. And body, I'm going to leave uh, the screen and give you uh, the platform uh, to yourself. Anything that you want to talk about uh, that we talked about today that you want to expound upon, anything that we didn't talk about that you wish we had, or just any message that you want to put out to everyone who's watching now. And again, thank you for being here today. It means the world to me. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much. And I think that, you know, I just want to echo your uh, celebratory message. Um, I love the idea of actually calling somebody that's on your Facebook list. Um, that <laughs> that's so special. It's like, oh, I'm just thinking, like, who's gonna who's gonna pop up there? But um, but I do want to celebrate live theater. I do believe that um, digital theater is additive to the industry. Um, I do think that it increases people's appetite to go see the live if you can watch it digitally. Um, so check out Broadway HD at broadwayhd.com um, and uh, and let us know. We're on all the social planner uh, social platforms, uh, so you can reach out through that or customer service. Um, so yeah, I mean, I I love the idea of celebrating things, and uh, we're not quite out of this pandemic completely. So I I do echo uh, Richard's uh, thoughts of um, reaching out to each other and uh, and the theater community just taking care of each other. Um, being part of the theater family, the theater community is so important to me. Um, and to have it be uh, happy and healthy is, uh, it should be important to everybody. So thank you so much for having me. Stay safe and uh, take care of each other.